gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Hadrigo Live. And this week we have the former Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, number 18, Khalith Wright, coming to sit down with us. He is a 32-year Air Force veteran, the second black Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, father of three, loving husband, and is coming down to sit down with us to share some gems. So if you want to hear, tune in to Hadrigo Live as it starts now. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Hadrico Live, and I'm your host, Hadrico, and today we have a very special guest. Now, most of you know him as 18, some of you know him as Chief, some of you know him as Enlisted Jesus, but for today, we're talking to Kay Wright. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest today is a former Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Khalid Wright. Kay Wright, how you doing this afternoon, or this morning? How you doing this morning, sir? Oh, man, I'm good, brother. Well, you know, it's, uh, it's afternoon for me, but... Uh, I'm doing good, man. Uh, we were just talking earlier before we jumped on, man, about the retirement life and how good it is. Uh, but yeah, life life is good. It's good to see you, man. Man, it's good to see you too, man. Last time I saw you in a in a normal capacity was when you was at Ramstein when you had just got the the new gig and everything was going, and then. It was like a whirlwind. That was like probably the fastest four years I've ever seen because you was there. And then next thing I know, you was all over the world and everything changed. How, how is it now that life is begin to slow down for you a little bit? Yeah, yeah. I think I remember, man, we first met, I believe it was at a 5-6 meeting in, mm-hmm. uh, in, in, in Ramstein. But and you're right, man, things things uh, started moving pretty fast since then. But but uh, now that life has has slowed down, uh, man, it's just amazing how. Uh, you allow both your body and your mind to recover after running so hard. You know, I did 32, almost 32 years in the, in the air force and, and those last uh, probably six or seven, man, were pretty demanding jobs. And that, that uh, had me doing quite a bit of traveling and, and a lot of intense issues working, you know, for, for the air force and for some of our partner nations. Uh, so it's just been great, man, to be able to play golf, to travel, uh, to have a job where I had the flexibility. I still get to serve and help people. I get to spend a lot of time with family. I get to spend a lot of time with my friends, smoking cigars and drinking scotch. It's bro. So, you, bro. so you're having a good time. You're having a good yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. I right, listen, it's good <laughs> to see the fruits of your labor have paid off and now you get the chance to success and, and, and bask in it. So you know yeah. what? What we gonna do? We gonna do this three different ways. We gonna start in the beginning. We gonna go in the middle. We gonna come to an end. Because I did a little research. I did a little looking. You know, I had to do, you know look up a couple. I didn't have to look too hard. You know, you all over. I got to type in. I ain't even got to spell out the whole name. That's when you know you popping. When I don't got to put in your whole name and everything comes up. So, <laughs> Chief, listen. You started off at at Winston Salem University. You was playing basketball. Young man, you made the basketball team. You pledged for the fraternity. Technically, in most people's opinion, life was going the right way in school, doing good things. But then you still decided to join the Air Force. My question to you is, what changed? What was your why that forced you to come out of what most would consider to be the right path to join a different path? Yeah. <clears throat> so so essentially, I was only at Winston-Salem State University, man, for about six to eight months, if I, if I remember correctly. I did walk on and make the basketball team, didn't get to play in, 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 in any games. I left before the, the season really got started. Um, and, I, and I actually didn't pledge until later, later in life. So I didn't pledge when I was at, at Winston-Salem, Winston-Salem State. Um, but, it's, you know, long story short, man, I was trying to be slick. I, I'm from Georgia. I was going to school in North Carolina because of my older brother. Uh, I was pretending to be an out of, uh, in-state student. They, they caught me. <laughs> Uh, and and sent me home. <laughs> Listen, they, they catch you every time. I be trying to pull off fast ones. I still get caught yeah, every time. Yeah, too, trying man. to pull a fast one, trying to be slick, and, and 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 ended up back home. And I had no plans on joining the military at all, man. I grew up in Columbus, Georgia, Army town, so I was familiar with the military, but just with my thing. Uh, but I knew I wasn't gonna be just back home hanging out, laying on my mama's couch, and you know wasting time. So just on the whim, man, I joined the Air Force, and I planned on doing my four years and getting out and then 
shit. <laughs> Years later, 32 right? years later that's yeah. that's one hell of a whim i tell you what if you get a whim on some lotto numbers let me know because apparently you got some you got some quantified whims man so okay let's transition you join into the air force so everybody knows where we're going to end up going with this because everybody wants to everybody loves to hear about the the accolades in the top but you know what one thing i like to do here with the motivational piece i want to see where we came from how did we get there what are some of the hurdles that you had to get through in your career that probably could have stumbled, stopped you from being who you are, but you were able to overcome. Yeah. So uh, um, the biggest hurdle, man, and I tell people this all the time is, was myself, right? I could not get out of my own way, man, as a, as a young man, you know, I was, I lacked discipline. I wasn't a good teammate. Um, you know, I, I was, you know, I had no direction. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, I lashed out at, I made excuses for everything that happened to me, every bad thing that I did. I, mean, I used to get a lot of trying to fight a lot. And, and I still, man, I was always trying to be slick and always getting caught. So I wasn't really, really, really that good at, at, uh, at that stuff. But, um, you know, the thing that I had to overcome was myself. And, and I had to learn how to stop making excuses for myself. I had to learn to surround myself, man, with, with good people who were, you know, positive and trying to trying to uh, make something out of themselves, you know, just like uh, I eventually learned learned to. Uh, but a lot of my problems, most of my problems, were were caused by me. And and as much as I would like to point the finger at some bad supervisor or the Air Force or the system or whatever, uh, when I realized at about 17 years um, that I was the problem, uh, then 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 my career really started to take off, man. At 17 years in. 17 years in, yeah. Uh, and I had a good career, man. I was getting promoted almost either first or second time every single time. Um, you know, I was winning all kinds of awards. I mean, I had a, I had a good career, but I still had this, this uh, you know, I didn't understand the importance of relationships. Mm. Uh, you know, I wasn't really taking responsibility. And I, when something good happened, you know, when I won an award or when my people <clears throat> won an award, I was all, hey, man, that's right. It's me, k right. Get it. right? And uh, but then when something happened, man, I was blaming everybody else. And, and so I just learned to to take a hard look in the mirror, man, and start taking responsibility for the things that I was doing and the mistakes that I was making. And uh, it really, really uh, helped me. Now, you've always been really vocal about Tech Sergeant Wimbush being a big part of your your maturation process. What kind of helps you become from that boy to a man and taking an accountability the things that he helped mold you to become? Is that what kind of guided you and pushed you to be so people centric wanting to help people and kind of reach out and lend that helping hand. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, man. He planted, you know, I kind of already, you know, I, I think I inherited some of this from my mother, but, but he really brought out the, the best in me in, in terms of taking care of people, just, just watching him, you know, t him taking care of me really was, was kind of the, 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 the thing that got me, um, you know, the way that I am, but, but really just watching him take care of so many other people. Right. So I, I, I have the the opportunity and the microphone to talk about him publicly. But but, man, there's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 other of my friends and people that I grew up in the Air Force with that he did the same thing for. They just never had the you know the opportunity to speak about it the way the, the way that I do, at least at least publicly. So just watching how every friend of mine. Uh, you know, they consider him pops too, man. Cause I, I bring, I mean, it was like a homeless shelter, like a, like a, like, like lost he, puppies. He opened in service. Come one, come all, come over to the wind yeah, bush. And, and he was hard on all of us. And, uh, and so I just, you know, I watched him man, what he did and, and how him and, and my mom, Diane, <clears throat> you know, how they took care of people. And I just tried to do the same thing, man. I learned a lot from him about, about being tough, but fair about being patient and allowing people the room and the space to grow. Now, you know, he'll cuss you out. And I'll cuss you out, too. But uh, it's, it was, it's all in love, man. That's, that's what's up. Now, you've, you've been also, you said one of your favorite books is The Alchemist. And the quote that you keep saying is that, you know, when you decide what you want, the universe will conspire to help you achieve it. So as we yeah. progress here, when did you decide that you wanted to be the chief master of the Air Force and what fell into place? Because that don't just happen by coincidence. You don't just wake up and be like, you know what? I'm going to be the chief master of the Air Force. Things have to line up. What were some of those things that fell into place for you? Yeah, man. So the Alchemist and, and you know, it's just funny. I didn't read it until until later in life. I'd always heard about it. And just just never, never took the opportunity to read it. But um, I think I, I decided when I was a senior airman to get my life together. And, and one thing that I, I don't know if I inherited 
inherited it, but um, I always liked leading. I loved being being in charge of stuff. I wasn't necessarily that good at it, but if there was a team, I was going to be the captain. If there was an organization, I'm going to be the president. I don't want to be the vice president or the secretary. Like I just liked the idea of you know being in charge and, and leading people. And uh, so when I was a senior airman, man, I decided I, I'd, I'd seen some chiefs, you know, back then it wasn't, you didn't see chiefs and, and talk to them and, and spend time around unless you was getting cussed out. And, uh, and I just decided, you know what, that's the best you can be. That's, that's, that's going to be me. And, uh, but I, but I didn't know about the chief master sergeant of the air force. Um, and honestly, I, I don't know when that became a goal. I, I, I've had several people tell me, man, I remember you was a tech sergeant. You said you was going to be the chief master sergeant of the Air Force. And I laughed so hard. I'm like, boy, you can't be no chief master sergeant of the Air Force. <laughs> and uh, so apparently it's, it's been something, man, that was in me for, for, for a long time. And, and, and the reality is, you know, you can't control it, man. You, you can't consciously, uh, I think, just say, hey, I'm going to be the chief master sergeant of the Air Force. And then things will, will line up. I think I just decided that um, I'm gonna do I'm gonna do the best that I can. Uh, mm-hmm. I always knew uh, there was no doubt in my mind that I could be the chief master sergeant of the Air Force. I personally didn't think the timing and and the omens, as they say in the Alchemist Man, would would actually um, align uh, for me to have an opportunity. Well, I tell you what, not only did you do it by all records, you did a damn good job. So let's keep yeah. this thing rolling. So let's let's stay in this realm. Take me through that call, you know, because I don't got a call before like, hey, son, husband, you ain't got to come to work today. And I was like, I was really excited on that call. But take me through the emotion of the type of call you get when they say, hey, Chief Wright, you about to be the next Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force. What goes through your mind in that moment? Yeah. Well, a little bit of background before the call, right? So I got the first call was, hey, General Goldfein wants you to come to D.C., you and Tanya come to D.C. and interview to be the Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force. So I said, okay. Um, and at that time, I was, I, I knew that I was being considered. I didn't think I really had a chance. Um, but once I got that call, I was like, oh, <laughs> put me in the game, coach. I'm shooting. It's, it's on. <laughs> like, I, I mean, I had just decided, even before I got to DC, I'm about to be the damn chief master of the Air Force. Okay. Ain't, you know, this is about to happen. I don't care who competing or what, what's going on. And uh, so, of course, I did my preparation and stuff, and we had a great interview. I was the first up out of three of us. And actually, before I, before me and my wife left the hotel and went to the, the interview, I, I wrote that in my journal. I still got it. I'm about to be the mother effing chief master in the Air Force, right? That's what I'm talking about. And uh, <clears throat> and so when I left the interview, it, I was like, that's it. It's a lock. It's, it's, it's game on. And, and he told me, he said, hey, I'll call you in a week. And I had no stress, no anxiety. I wasn't worried. I just had decided, okay, I'm about to be chief master of the Air Force. So, so when he called me, man, when I got the call, um, again, no stress, no anxiety. I, I was just like, you know, hey, it's about to be on. And he said, hey, I'd love for you to come and be chief master of the Air Force. I was like, okay, Let's hey, I'll see it. you in a couple months. And, and then he did tell me your first job is you can't tell nobody for three weeks. <laughs> And, uh, now that's a hell of a secret. In, I actually got in trouble, man, because my wife knew when the call was coming, and she said, "As soon as you hang up that phone, you better call me." And and so I hung up the phone, and then I started working with my exec to you know travel and planning and canceling this. And and I looked at my phone, man. My wife sent me like ten texts, like, "What the is going mm-hmm. on? Where? What? What's what's happening?" I said, "Hey, let's get ready to move to DC." You know. Listen, she said, "Listen, I, don't, I ain't got time for what he talking about. You supposed to call me. You better get your life together." You, yeah, you, that, I, listen, you know how you know how the honeydew list goes. Let's yeah. stay behind the curtain. We behind we we behind the scenes right now. Let's stay behind the scenes. As in that role, what was what was your favorite part of being the chief master on the Air Force? But then on the flip side of that, what was one of your biggest struggles? What was one of the hardest parts of, be, of being in that type of position? Um, so my favorite part by far, man, was was you know getting to spend time with airmen all across the the globe, right? So doing what they do, working with them, talking to them, um, especially some of our airmen that were struggling with you know um, either uh, terminal terminal illness or um, uh, depression issues and stuff like that. Just being able to be there and, and help help our airmen. So anything, anytime I, I got to deal with airmen and, and their issues, it was, it was a, it was a great thing. Man. So I love that part of the job. I tell you what I hated most, man, was um, 
the 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 bureaucracy uh, that is the Air Force and the Department of Defense and trying to get stuff done. Right. So I, I thought we had some really good things that that uh, we were trying to do for people. And it just so much red tape and so much paperwork and, and, and so many obstacles and barriers that are just inherently in place in government, period, um, that, it, it, you know, it would get frustrating uh, at times that it, it would take so long for us to do some of these things. And, and some of them we still, you know, couldn't get across the finish line um, just because, you know, the way the system is, is set up and in design in the government. You know, I can understand that. You know, we have bureaucracy too at, at, at my job. You know, sometimes we can't get everybody, you know, lunch on. No, I'm just playing. We ain't got no. <laughs> I, I had to throw something in there. Um, so, you know, you were a title enlisted Jesus. Now, listen, that's a, that's a, that's rarefied. Yeah. I even seen one child, you was a Halloween costume. This man <laughs> came to work as Chief Wright. I mean, that's like, that's like saying Kobe. Like, you became an adjective. That's you have made it in this world. How do you handle living up to that type of pressure, that type of rock star status and still maintain who you are and the foundation of who you were raised to be? Yeah, man, because, uh, you know, I've always been uh, um, some people might (laughs) might disagree, especially if you see me on a basketball court or on a golf course or something competing, man. But I've always been uh, pretty humble and I've always been intentional about staying humble. Right. It's not something that just you can just do that just comes naturally to you. You know, you have to actively, you know, m- manifest and tell yourself that, OK, I'm not going to allow um, this attention or these things to, to go. I mean, it's hard enough staying humble. as just a, a chief. Right. Uh, because people are always doing stuff for you and going out of their way to treat you, treat you well because of your ranking. And so when when that stuff started happening, um, you know, I just took it as, hey, man, I, I think people appreciate uh, what I'm doing. Um, I was careful not to to use the, the the term myself or to promote it or anything in, in, in that nature. But but I was also careful not to tell people that they couldn't use it. Right. That they couldn't. I, I mean, I, I, I understood that uh, it was potentially uh, offensive to some people from a religious standpoint. But but also, man, folks were just having fun. They were just finding a different and unique way to show appreciation. The memes got better over the years. But they, first, the memes was kind of raggedy. And then uh, they got so good after a while. And then, of course, the costume just uh, – that, that, that young man, man, all that Luke, man, hit, that blew my mind when I saw that. So, um, But, yeah, it's, you know, I've always been that way, man. You just never forget where you came. I come from some humble beginnings, man, and I remember what it was like uh, to be an airman. I, I remember what it's like to struggle. And uh, so I always just try to tr- try to meet people – you know, where they are and never create this, you know, I'm here, you're there, you can't talk to me uh, kind of kind of situation. And, uh, and and I had a lot of people around me, too, man, that helped me with that. Completely understand. Now, a lot of times when we get in these roles, everybody focuses on the member. They talk about, oh, what you had to deal with this and what are you going through on this, this and that. But you also a family man. You also have a wife. You have kids. This type of role, this type of, of public light. How was that effect on the family? How much did that change your family dynamics? How was the effect in, in your home life? Yeah, so the kids are all, you know, uh, grown and gone and stuff. Well, my youngest son is in his freshman year and you're in college. And and so um, it didn't change. It didn't affect a whole lot with the with the kids. But, man, it's hard on the marriage, man. It's hard um, just because of not only the, you know, the travel is one thing. Uh, you know, I was I was on the road about 290 days a, a year when I was the chief master in the Air Force. So and some of that was most of it was two days here, three days there, sometimes an hour and back a one day trip. And on occasion, uh, if I went to the West Coast or if I went to um, Europe or all the way to the PAC app, you know, a, a longer, a little bit longer trip. But uh, but nonetheless, you know, being gone a lot and, and the first year or, or so, you know, Tanya actually traveled with me. And uh, so, you know, we still had an opportunity to spend spend some time together. The trips were were pretty demanding. Uh, in terms of the time commitment that that it required, um, so yeah, not 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 only that, but then just the stress of of the job and all of the decisions and working through and all the communications and all that type of stuff. You know, I did my best, man, to to at you know four o'clock, five o'clock, walk walk away from the Pentagon and not have to think about that stuff. But um, you know, it wasn't quite that easy, right? Because I would get phone calls and texts and and stuff. And even even me, I wasn't that good at 
protecting my own team's time, right? I'd be laying around at 10 o'clock and think, oh, yeah, we can do this. And then I'd be texting text and, and all that type of stuff. So, um, yes, yeah, it's, it's pretty demanding on family life, man. It just requires a lot of anytime you're in a job like that. And I know lots of other people in the Air Force, man, have demanding jobs where they travel and they work hard. And, and, and so I would say for anybody, uh, you know, communication is, is, is really the, the, the key and sacrifice, you know. Communication is the key. You were in the seat when America and the Air Force was in a very difficult time, and you were very vocal about your stance. You were not silent, which is very rare in leadership. Some leaders, when something goes on, they don't want to speak about it, but you didn't take that stance. But did you ever feel that you had to juggle your feelings or water down your viewpoint as a black male due to your position? If not, what advice would you give leaders and future leaders to learn how to speak up no matter what color you are and say what needs to be said? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, America has always been in a difficult time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the George Floyd incident, along with all of the other incidents, have just, you know, kind of maybe exacerbated, you know, that the the challenges of being a black person in this in this country, and the and the even more difficult challenge of being a black person in in the United States military. And so there were times, man, throughout my my career and my life where um, I felt like I couldn't truly express, you know, how I felt and what I felt. Because truth be told, um, this gentleman over my, my shoulder here, Muhammad Ali, uh, Malcolm X, you know, those are the people that I grew up admiring and still admire. And of course, you know, they ain't hold nothing back. Right? <laughs> nothing. They ain't pulled no punches. And so. You know, there are often times, man, when I really, really wanted to express how I truly felt about, you know, what was happening in this country. And and but I understood the position that I was in and and and, and why I necessarily couldn't. Um, the George after George Floyd, man, it was just on my mind. It was I mean, it was really on my heart, to be honest, that because because what happened is on the side, you know, people started asking me, hey, you know, okay, right. What you think about this, man? What you what you think about that? And and I'm trying to balance. Okay, we got the Department of Defense and the SecDef saying, "Don't nobody say nothing." Um, with yeah, but shit, something need to be said, and 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 people want to know. And and this is not the time for me to 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 be a coward. This is not the time for me to, you know, to tap dance or play politics. I, I think you know people need to hear. Um, you know, how I feel and how I see the situation. And so, man, I wrote that in about 30 minutes. Um, I woke up after a long weekend. I'm just thinking about it. Um, at 30 minutes, man, I sat down at my kitchen table, did it up. And, uh, <clears throat> and I sent it to my team with the express instructions not to change anything. Uh, you can fix grammar, you can fix spelling, but don't change any of the content. I, I put every word in there, um, the amount of times that I put in there, the ad adjectives that I use, I put it in there for a reason. And, uh, and then, and then what we got it all together. Um, and we, you know, we had to go through PA, um, uh, to, to publish and, and they were saying, well, you know, we got this. I said, Hey man, this is what I said. And this is you know, like, we releasing, you know, I, I I'm sorry. I, I, I mean, I, I'll, and I'll take the, the, the bullet for, for what it was. I did send it to my boss though. And I told General Goldfink, Hey man, I'm about to publish this. I'm not really asking for permission. I just wanted to give you a heads up. And uh, he was like, man, this is powerful. He sent it to uh, like four black retired four-star generals. And, and, um, and then, you know, it, it released. And uh, of course there was some backlash. There were some people who didn't like it. And uh, there was a lot of, a lot of positive stuff from it too though. But how encouraging was it for you to get that type of support from General Goldfein to get to because I, I watched the conversation that you had. And one piece that I thought was even powerful for him when he said, listen, most systems are built for me. And my and when I walk into the room, it's already built to him to have that type of transparency. And then for you to send him this letter and most people and I've seen it in my time. Well, when you start talking about these taboo type subjects, they want to. Oh, oh, no, no, we're, we're not going to do that. How did it, what did it change your viewpoint? Not that you had a bad viewpoint, but how did you feel about him afterwards seeing the support that he was willing to put behind you? Yeah, well, it's just validate what I already knew, man. That's my dog, man. We, <laughs> we, we, we became so tight, you know, as a, as a leadership team. We really became like brothers, to be, to be honest, man. I still, I just talked to him uh, this morning and, 
And and so I I, I suspected that he was he was going to be supportive. I thought he might have had questions or might have wanted to to look at it, but he was totally and completely uh, supportive. And then we we rallied and got together and, and determined that hey, we probably need to say something like. And that and that and that initial, you know, before we did the town hall, we did about a seven minute clip that was released. And uh, you know, and he didn't know I was going to say this to him, but but I said, hey, boss, you you know, we're late to the party on this, you know. We, th- we, we should have said something about this, you know, a long time ago. And, and he acknowledged it and, uh, and and he didn't want it cut either. Right. So I said, hey, you know, I, I, I didn't mean to bring that on you, but he was like, no, just publish it the, the way that it is. So uh, it just validated for me, man, that he's he's he was a great boss, a great wingman and uh, that we were on the same page. That's always amazing. And that's something I think all leaders we got to take up. You know, we at a time now. Speak up. Say what needs to be said, because a lot of times these conversations, they don't happen. So as the chief Masson, you had a gigantic impression. I mean, you probably was one of the most like popular and man, this chief, right? It's just every ah, literally rock star status. But then you had an effect on history. You know, you're one of the few medical chief masters in the Air Force. You're the second black African-American chief master in the Air Force. We all know right now, as we're living, we're a part of history. But, you know, your history is going to be documented, man. People are going to be studying about you if we keep testing. I don't know. I have a lot of changes. I don't know if you want to drop a couple, you know, blip, blip, couple of gems. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> a couple of gems out here. Um, but if we keep testing, I mean, your legacy is going to be studied. How do you feel about that? And what is the biggest mark or legacy that you would have hoped to have left on the Air Force? Um, so I'm, I'm you know, uh, clearly humbled, man, by... Uh, the idea that you know I'll I'll um, you know be in the history books and whatnot. Uh, although I think there's so many so many people, man, uh, at all levels of the Air Force uh, that deserve so much more recognition than than I got. Right, so I happen to be in the position, and and we 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 took full advantage of social media and the tools that were available to to get the work that we were doing out out to the people. But man, there's a lot of other people who will be in the history books as well, man, that I'll be, you know, excited to, 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 to read about. And I just appreciate, you know, what, what they've done. I appreciate uh, all the love and love and support. I think from a legacy standpoint, man, all, what i tell you, all I want people to remember is that, man, that was a good dude right there. <laughs> That's um, what's up. You know, all that other crap, man, changing this PME, blah, 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 man, nobody really care about that, man. And ain't nobody going to care about it, you know, 10 years from now, cause ain't nobody going to remember. Right. Um, but I, but I think if people could remember like, man, K. Wright, he was a good dude, man. He was easy to talk to, you know, he did everything he could to take care of us. And, uh, I, I think that's, that's, that's perfect for me. Okay. Now there's a secret. I've watched this movie called national treasure. They say, you know, when the president changes over, I know they write each other a letter, but it's supposed to be like this secret book that with all the secrets of the, of the, the country. So when you and chief Bass changed over, what was some of these secrets that y'all had changed? Like, I got to get an exclusive out of you, Chief. I got to get something that came away. We got to have a Hadrico Live exclusive. So yeah. what, did you write her a letter? What are some advice you gave her taking over that chair for her to move forward and push the Air Force to the next level? Yeah, so so I've known Joe for, for years, and and I've, uh, you know, to some extent tried to be a mentor and a, and a good friend and colleague to to her. So I didn't, I didn't need to... Uh, I didn't, I didn't write her a letter, but I spent a lot of time, you know, just, just talking to her about the job and, and, uh, and I was careful not to, to, um, to tell, to try to get her to look at the job from my point of view. Right. Um, the one thing that I told her that I think is, was probably most important that everybody can learn from is, Hey, Joe, it's your job now. You, you do it your way. Um, you wouldn't be here if you weren't prepared and, and fully ready to take on the job. Don't worry about what I think or nobody else. You change whatever you want to change. Cause frankly, I don't care. Right. I had my chance. And if you change everything I did, it won't make me, you know, one, one, one difference. And, and I, I really just wanted to instill in her, man, that the job was hers. Now I'm always here to support if she has questions. Uh, but mostly I wanted to, uh, get out of her way, allow her to do the, do the job the way that she's comfortable doing it and not have to worry about, well, I wonder what K-Rag will think if I don't continue doing this or if I change, um, you know, this or that. Now, you spent 32 years in the Air Force. You spent about 32 minutes talking about the Air Force. 
We're done with that. Let, let's let's trend. Let's talk to K right now. Now that you have retired, you went from being Chief Wright to K Wright for officially. After four years and thirty two four years in that seat, thirty two years in the military. What is something that we don't know about you? When you live so publicly, I feel like everybody knows everything. But what is something that most people don't know about K Wright? Oh man. Um well, I tried to be K right even when I was in, man. You know, sometimes it worked, sometimes it it, it, it didn't. But um, I think most people probably know I'm an avid golfer. Uh, most people probably know, especially if they follow me on Facebook, that I love cigars and good scotch and and, and bourbon. Uh, people might not know unless you were stationed with me in uh, Korea in 07 to 09 uh, that I'm a poet. I used oh. to do open mic uh poetry with with uh you know Seth Scooby and uh there was a there was a whole group of us man every Friday night man we used to burn it up at the Blue Opera and uh we started it used to be at the club on base and then we moved down to the Blue Opera so I do love poetry though I, I love writing uh poetry Nikki Giovanni is is one of my favorite uh poets so um that's probably something people don't know and and i'm an aspiring electric guitar player man i can't i don't i don't, I don't even know how to hold a thing uh, <laughs> but i got two of them and uh i need to take some lessons man because i just love you know i really like blues music and jazz music and so i'm gonna learn to play the electric guitar okay right you got two guitars you can't play that's rich people problems right there you talking about <laughs> you said come on now now you say you're a poet i mean I mean, if you listen, this is gonna be seen by a lot of people here go your debut you you got you if you got one it's a good time to we can get a K right. It's coming. No, 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 man. no. I ain't, I ain't you ain't got, ready yet? Okay, me. okay. It's it's actually been a while since I wrote. I was gonna I was gonna publish a book of poetry. Um, I realized that while I was in, I couldn't. And and, and if I ever publish it, you'll see you'll see why. Um, go back <laughs> to those that Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali. Back in them days. Okay. I, I got some. I got some pretty unique thoughts about um, you know this country and. And lots of other things that probably weren't appropriate because at the time I think I was a senior master sergeant when I was when I was looking looking to do it. So okay, oh, well look, we're gonna stay on the lookout for poet <laughs> K Wright. Yeah, oh, listen, we, we got to get you right, man. So how much has changed for you in your new role as the CEO of the Air Force Aid Society? I know it's, it's different than what you've had before, but how much has changed for you now in this not in your new pace of life? Yeah, so the uh, the role is is a little little bit different. I mean, I'm still taking care of airmen, albeit in in a pretty uh, focused way. You know, in the Air Force Aid Society, we primarily do emergency assistance, um, and then we do scholarships, and then a little bit of community programs. You know, child care, spouse employment, and a few other things. But um, so in the in the same vein, I'm still getting to take care of you know airmen and and, and their families. But uh, from a CEO perspective. Uh, it's a little bit different, right? So I'm not going out, uh, I'm not visiting airmen and, and and doing all that good stuff, man. You know, my primary, the thing that's most important to me uh, right now is fundraising, right? So the more money we can raise, uh, the more we can give away uh, the, and the more people we can help. You know, right now, we, we only, the only people eligible for our assistance, active duty, retirees, uh, if you're a guardsman or a reservist, you got to be on status, right? You got to be on orders or active duty status uh, to, to receive uh, funding from us. And I really want to expand that to any any Air Force veteran. Uh, okay. You know, clearly there's there's a lot of people who served, you know, three years, four years, seven years, 12 years or whatever, and they got out and they made significant contributions and they contributions and they may find themselves homeless or in you know, some other type of trouble. And I like to be able to extend you know what we do to them, but in order to do that, we just got to raise more more money. Uh, so the job itself, man, is is a lot less stressful. It's a lot easier. Hey, being a CEO, man, is I love it because you know you get to decide you know what you want to do, and you don't have to work through no whole lot of bureaucracy with with uh, with, with with other folks, and and you can make stuff happen. You can make it happen quick. That's well, if like you that. you ever need an overpaid assistant, I'm gonna be available here in a couple months, man. I, you know, I, I'm willing to move. I'm willing to relocate for the right price. Keyword is overpriced. You know what I mean? I just got to be paid properly. No, hey, you know what? Hey, hey, it's funny, man. Let me pull on that for a second. Go right? ahead. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> what you said when you said about relocating? Uh, hey, man, we're all virtual in this in this world now, man. I, and I think that's gonna change the dynamic on in a lot of careers and a lot of professions, is that uh, you don't have to relocate, right? Um, we're in the process of hiring folks and and they don't have to come to, to the DMV, to DC in order to, to, to work from, 
for, for us because uh, we can do things, uh, almost everything that we can do, we can do virtually. So you did mention something about donating. So if somebody was to, wanted to donate, if their heart was touched, how could they get in contact? Or who, who do we who do they send their donations to? How do we do yeah, that? I think the, the easiest way, man, is just Google or go to AFAS, uh, you know, dot org and, you know, jump on the website, man. And you can give until your heart is content, man. We need every penny we can get because, again, uh, you know, everything that we take in, it goes back out to, to help uh, airmen and airmen and families. That sounds good. So, you know, we're going we're gonna to switch it up this last question. We're going to do a rapid fire. Uh, K, K writes Fab Five. I'm going to list some and you tell me what's your favorite. It's things you love, so something should be fairly easy to you. So we're going to start off simple. Favorite cigar? Andalusian Bull. Oof, okay, all right. Favorite golf course? Hmm. That means you've been playing too much golf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Grand Coyote in in um uh dang, where did I just go? In Mexico, uh Cancun. Cancun. Cancun, huh? <laughs> Must be. I I'm I can't wait for time now. Oh. All right. Favorite scotch. Balvini 14 year Caribbean cask. I mean he got that thing down. You <laughs> love you, bro. Okay, okay. All right. I got a tie in for my and now it's gonna be hard for you to do now. Favorite base you visited? That's a tough one. Ooh. Uh, probably Herbert Field. Okay. Uh, just because I got to do so much fun stuff, man, with the AFSOC guys, you know, flying in the back of helicopters and, and suiting up with the PJs and, and firing all kinds of weaponry. It was, it was, it was pretty fun. That was, that was a great, great uh, base to visit. All right. Last one. Favorite Air Force memory? Hmm. Uh, I would say, man, my favorite Air Force uh, memories are the times that, that I spent when I was an airman. Uh, I had a group of friends and we're all still friends uh, right now. Everybody's either out or retired. But the times that we had uh, playing ball, we used to go to the gym every Saturday. We actually used to go to the gym every day, except Friday. You know, Friday we was trying to get our groove on. <laughs> Gym every day, and uh, so I've got fond memories of all of us going to the gym, sitting uh, sitting on the curb, drinking forties after we after we done you know crushed uh, some souls in the gym, and then having cookouts uh, at the crib on the weekends and stuff. So just that that initial set of friends that I met when I first came in, man, Greg Jones, Tony Paler, Tony Hill, Tony Fannin, uh, you know Joe Wimbush and Diane and. And uh, Bell, Fonte Simmons, and you know Peanut, Craig Pearson, all of us, man. Pete Smith, we just had a really, really good uh, group of people, man, that we spent time with. Paula Smith, who who was like my sister, we went to basic training, um, tech school together, and our first base together, and we've been like brother and sister ever since. So those those are I think my fondest memories of being in the Air Force. It's just those first days, man. No worries, just having a good time and enjoying life. I tell you what. That's what I'm talking about. And this brings to what I like to call the final timeout. And the final timeout today, ladies and gentlemen, you can be whatever you want to be. If you want to be the chief mass on the Air Force, you set your mind to it and you, you, you never take no for an answer. You see what K. Wright did. He came in, he conquered, he took over what he had to. He, didn't, he wasn't stopped by position. He wasn't stopped by situation. He spoke his mind when he needed to. Sometimes we have to do that. Sometimes you got to take charge of your own life. Are you taking charge of your life or you let somebody else pay rent for you? Are you let somebody else guide you around? Because if you are, I advise you to take back over what you have and what you want. We like to thank our guests, K. Wright, for joining us. We like to thank our supporters, the Brown family, Brickhouse Barbecue, the Aziz family, Brian Franklin, all my Patreon supporters, LaShawn Cremati. Listen, I'm start, my sponsorship's starting to grow. If you want to be a Patreon, you can be one too. Don't worry, all the information will be available. But Chief, you got anything else before we let you go? No, man, I just want to say thanks, man. And I'm proud of you, bro. Just, just uh, you know, watching watching you do your thing, man. And and I love the entrepreneur spirit, man. That's something that, you know, I'm an entrepreneur myself, man. I got a coaching business and um, I, I love to see, you know, people like yourself, man, that that don't allow themselves to be confined by what the Air Force allows you to do or, uh, you know, your service to the to the nation. So, man, keep doing what you're doing. Um, it's, it's, it's fun to watch, man. So brothers like you and Scoob and Blackjack and all, all you guys, man, that, that, are, that, are, that are making, you know, this, this world a better place, man, by bringing content like this. It's, it's, it's just a joy to see, man. 
So well, thank you. We definitely want to thank you for taking the time, man, because I know your schedule is big to sit down and get on get on the podcast with us and and share some gems because I'm sure a lot of people are going to get something from this, man. But ladies and gentlemen, that concludes another episode of Hadrico Live, and we are out. Mm-hmm.